So there are a number of guides you can find online for how to do PCB layout. Uh, these will cover things like how to make parts in your library, how to lay your parts out, uh, align them. You know, This guide will start from the end of that and go on into how to actually produce your PCB. Um, this is assuming you don't want to pay the money to have somebody else produce it, so you're going to try to do it all yourself. Now, I'm using the Eagle platform. This is a pretty common platform for hobbyists uh, because it's a free software package if you're using the free version, which limits you to two layers of copper as well as uh, limits your maximum board size. And you'll find that a lot of products for smaller things you want to build, you know, assuming you're not designing a motherboard or anything like that, uh, you can usually get away with just two layers. So uh, the free version is free to use, of course, if you're using it for personal pr purposes and not for uh, commercial purposes. Given that I'm not going to be talking about the layout itself, I do want to give a few comments uh, for things to keep in mind while you're doing your layout. So I'm going to start by talking about the dimension layer. Uh, dimension will dictate the outer edge of your PCB. So when you're designing your uh, your PCB, if you're d doing it for um, an enclosure, you want to make sure that that dimension layer will let you do that. I actually find this very easy to do if you take a look at the data sheet for your enclosures. This is a Hammond manufacturing part, and the reason I usually stick with them for my projects is because I think every single one of their cases has a maximum PC board size spec built into it. And this is really handy because a lot of times, you know, the data sheet will have a lot of details about the, the box, you know, how big it is and where the holes are and that kind of thing. However, there's things you can't really account for like manufacturing defects in certain boxes that might leave a little bit of plastic that will run into your board that you're not expecting or any kind of uh, doubt like that. But having it all laid out here makes it a lot easier. So as long as your board fits this outline, it'll fit in the case. And also includes the mounting holes, which is pretty handy. So going back to our board design, um, what I usually do is I actually have a certain uh, set of components in my library that are just board outlines, and they're for different cases, depending on which kind of case I want to use. Uh, I think if you look through my old products, you'll find that a lot of them use the same case. And this lets me just drag that component into my schematic, and then I already have the outline ready to go once I move over to PCB. Let's talk about reference designators. Uh, usually, I just turn all of them off. You see, I'm, they're kind of messy, and they're all over the place. Um, because I intend this board to be made myself, I know that I'm not gonna be printing any reference designators because I don't have any silk screen or solder mask to worry about. So we're gonna go ahead and just turn those off just so they're not so unsightly. With that out of the way, uh, talking about the actual layer decisions here. You'll see that I have most of my copper is on the is in blue, which means it's on the back layer. I'm using the default color scheme. So that's the uh, the bottom layer of the PCB. And this is kind of a, a, a personal preference of mine. I found it, I find it works really well. It can be a little mind boggling because a lot of things end up being mirrored a couple of times before you actually get your PCB. So the way I like to think of it is a lot of the inter uh, components that you interface with, things like switches, buttons, knobs, you know, potentiometers, whatever, are going to be through hole parts. So if they're a through hole part, that means that the part is on one side of the PCB and the soldering points are on the other side. So what I usually do is I put those parts on the top of the PCB and then all the copper on the back layer, on the bottom layer. And I find this to be pretty useful because when you are designing your, your board and you have any kind of physical interaction involved with whatever you're building, it's usually easiest to place the buttons and knobs in a way that you can see how they'll look on the final project. Uh, so for example, you know, let's say there's some critical orientation of buttons that had to be all in order uh, from left to right. You could hold your device up to the screen that you see here and those buttons would be in the exact same place. So it helps you avoid all the mental gymnastics. Things like your components, you know, your uh, ICs and resistors and whatnot, you don't really care about where those are placed because you'll never see them anyway and you'll never interact with them directly. So I find that works out pretty well. I have all of my copper on the bottom layer and on the top layer, all I have is these few traces here. These are going to actually be done with just a piece of wire soldered in place. Uh, there's not going to be any copper on the top layer. These are just kind of representative of where the trace is, or where the, uh, the wire is going to go. You have some limitations when you're manufacturing your own boards. Of course, like I said, there is no silk screen. There is no solder mask. There also is only one layer or maybe two layers. You're not going to be able to do you know, four or five or anything like that unless you, well, I can't anyway. But one thing you do want to keep in mind is that when you get a board professionally made, they're going to be able to get your trace thicknesses down to something like 0.01 inch, you know, very, very small. But when you print them yourself, you're going to have trouble with that because uh, if your copper trace is too thin, it will very easily peel up. Or when you go to etch it, your, your etchant might burn all the way through the trace and that'll cause you some problems and be a, a pain to debug. So I usually try to limit myself to 
0.024 inches is my minimum thickness. It's a good compromise between having it be thick enough to not be eaten away entirely by the etchant, but having it be thin enough that you could easily route it around components where you need to go. There are a few exceptions to this. Whenever I have to place a trace underneath uh, a, a resistor or capacitor or whatever, uh, I usually drop down to 0.016. And this is an 0603 part, and I find that this usually gives you enough space around the outside to keep it from shorting to the resistor or capacitor itself. But otherwise, I wouldn't recommend dropping down to 0.016. I also have a ground plane here. The ground plane is, of course, optional, but I find it useful for a number of reasons. For example, a lot of times when you have to add some bypass capacitance and you want to tie a capacitor to the ground or tie a line to the ground plane through a capacitor, you can simply solder them, uh, stitch them across from the line to the ground plane. And this is a lot easier than having to say run traces in wire all the way across the board to wherever your ground is. Another reason why they're very useful is because they will minimize the amount of copper that has to get etched away. Remember when you start, this is all copper and the etchant, whatever you're using to dissolve your copper is going to only eat away the black areas. So you usually want to try to uh, minimize the amount of copper that's eaten away. This will preserve your etchant. It'll you know, prevent it from getting diluted by all the copper dissolved in it. And it will also, uh, minimize the amount of time it takes to etch your copper because there's less there is less to dissolve so i think that just about covers everything with the uh the actual layout itself so let's go ahead and get ready to print now this process is kind of funny because usually when you get a pcb made you export a gerber file and that gerber file has in it all the data regarding which layer is which and where the components are what silk screen what solder mask and whatnot but we're only going to be printing one single thing and that is copper so we want to go ahead and turn off all those other layers um, I'm going to turn off the placement layers, origin layers, uh, drill layers, document layers, and all those kind of things. So that leaves us with this. Now, we're also going to turn off the top layer here because, remember, those are going to be done in wires. So what you're left is, with is basically everything that's going to be in copper, such as the vias and the uh, you know the ground plane and whatnot. Um, the one exception to this is the, uh, the dimension layer or the outline layer. I usually keep this in because when you're actually cutting out the board, you have a nice precise outline telling you where to cut away or where to drill your mounting holes or whatever. This layer is a lot thinner than the minimum 0.024 or 0.016. However, it's not, it'll still show up on your board. It probably will have a few areas where the copper has been eaten away entirely, but as long as you get a general idea of where the outline is, uh, you should be fine. It's just a visual indicator. It's not meant to actually be an electrical conductor. So the process of printing a PCB is sort of like printing uh, an iron-on t-shirt, which means you have to make sure that you print out the mirror image of what you want to actually eventually show up on the shirt. And it's this kind of a confusing process, and if you don't do it right, you'll end up with a mirror-imaged PCB, which I've done before, and it totally sucks. Uh, you have to print the whole thing out over again. So one thing to keep in mind when you're printing is that because we're working on the bottom layer, we're actually already looking at the mirror image of the final product. And if you don't believe me, uh, we can turn on the name layers on the bottom let's see, B names, and you'll see that all of our reference designators are reversed, backwards R, backwards C, backwards, well, U, uh, etc. So there is no mirroring, that ha there is no need to mirror anything at this point in the process because we're already looking at it mirrored, and when we do the final printing process, it'll be mirrored one more time, and we'll get the right copper. So we're going to go ahead and just say, when we print, we're going to keep this mirror thing unchecked. Now, if you're doing a two-layer PCB and you have a top layer, that layer does have to get mirrored so that it can be mirrored again and be proper. So mirror is going to be unchecked. Um, black is going to be checked because, well, otherwise you'll end up with, uh, if you have a color printer, it'll be kind of weird, you'll have a bunch of green and blue stuff. If you have a black and white printer, I think it'll try to print in grayscale, which will still be bad. So just go ahead and do black. It'll turn everything totally black. Um, you can usually see a preview here, although occasionally you don't see it, but it doesn't really matter. Other thing to look out for is the scale factor. I think the default is usually lower or tries to fit it to the size of the paper, making it huge or whatever. So make sure you do scale factor one. And that's about it. Uh, the alignment isn't really that that relevant. I had a while where my printer had a dirty cartridge and I'd get these blotches on a part of the paper. So I tried to print my boards so that they'd showed up on the other side of the paper, uh, somewhere far away from where the blotches ended up. And uh, that's why I use the alignment. But otherwise, you can do it centered or center left or whatever you want. It should be fine. So you now have your design printed out on a sheet of paper. And remember, again, this is the mirror image of the design, but it's still pretty useful for doing things like checking new footprints uh, for parts you haven't used before. And, you know, you can see here I'm putting a ICU down to make sure that my pinout is correct and that everything will fit, and there it goes, it does. Um, that's usually less of a guessing game because you can find data sheets with the uh, 
with the footprints of common parts um, or, you know, Eagles, Elvis, and built in. So that's not that big of a deal. Uh, in this case, this is a transformer for this design that I pulled out of a uh, something I bought. It was a EL wire transformer. So this is something that has no data sheet, has no labeling of any kind. So I had to kind of measure and guess to make sure that everything will fit. And I can sort of verify that here. Remember, um, because this is a top layer part, it's actually not a mirror image. Not that it matters for this sort of check because it is a symmetrical part. But I can place it down on these footprint, uh, on these holes here. And I don't know how well you can make that out, but it looks like it fits pretty well. Uh, it fits well enough for just those four pins. Once you're confident that your design looks good on paper, you can go ahead and print it out on transparency. And that's where you get this. I'm going to leave this sheet of paper here so you can actually see what's going on. It might kind of blend into the black table otherwise. But um, this is the transparency sheet. If your printer is running low on toner and this does not block light very well, it's kind of translucent, you might want to invest in a new toner cartridge because the process sort of depends on this being totally black or totally clear. You want to make sure that you don't have any blotches that can run over traces and um, possibly short things together, which would cause you some problems. When you're doing this, you also want to keep in mind for later which side of the transparency you're working on. It might be kind of hard to see here, but there is a shiny and a flat side. The flat side is the side that has the actual toner on it or, um, or printer ink or whatever, whereas the shiny side is the other side of the paper. So when you're using your copper clad, you want to make sure that the toner side is what goes against the copper. But more on that later. So talking about your copper clad, it comes in many different forms. Sometimes you can buy it like this, where it's just literally copper and fiberglass. This is actually a two-layer piece of copper clad, but you can see the copper is exposed and there's a the fiberglass in between the two layers of copper. Um, this is useful for some methods of PCB manufacture, depending on what you're doing. You know, you can do the toner transfer method, which basically involves ironing the toner onto the board. I've tried that before, didn't have very good experiences with that. So I'm gonna go ahead and say, don't buy it like this. Um, you can buy it with what's called photosensitive coating. And this is going to be a little more expensive. It'll come in a bag like this. It's a black bag. All the stuff I get is from MG Chemicals. I recommend them highly because, I don't know, they have worked really well for me. You can buy the copper cloud on DigiKey or Mouser or whatever. This has a layer of um, protective coating on it. Now, remember, this is a photosensitive layer, which I'll let you see for a little bit. I don't want to expose it for too long and ruin it. But um, I don't know if you can make it out in this corner. I'm peeling off here. It's kind of a bluish color, and uh, that is, when that's exposed to light, it alters it chemically, and you can then develop it. Before we can even get to that, we have to cut this out in the shape of our PCB. So what I usually do is I cut the major outline first, etch it, and then once it's done etching, I can use the, um, the details on the, uh, the dimension layer which we kept to actually cut out things like corners and drill holes and that sort of deal. So the first step's gonna be to etch this thing. And I look like I lucked out here because the piece that I have left just fits the, um, the PCB that I'm dealing with. I guess the uh, dimensions all lined up right. So all I have to do is continue to cut along this line. If this doesn't work out quite this well, what I usually do is take a pair of calipers, measure a dimension that I need. I can either you know look at the number on there and by reading it off the computer or just measure it physically. And once I have that number, say here it looks like it's uh, 1.36 inches, I can then sc well, screw it tight and then scratch that marking with the caliper. And you probably can't see it in the video, it's very faint, but it's um, this little mark there, it's why calipers have pointy tips. You could also use a ruler and a pencil for all that matters, it's not that big of a deal. Um, so the next step's gonna be to cut that line and get this guy ready for etching. There's a number of ways to cut PCBs. Um, you can use things like a paper cutter, some people use, if you don't really care much about keeping the paper cutter around afterwards, um, or tin snips or all kinds of stuff. What I use is something, I don't know if I can recommend it or not, it's a Dremel tool, which will do a really good job of cutting off the board. You can actually, um, you can do really fine details. Uh, I use a ceramic cutoff wheel. The problem with using a Dremel tool though, is that it will produce a lot of dust. And this is fiberglass dust, which is not really healthy to breathe in. So I recommend doing it in a very well ventilated area. Um, invest in one of these. This is a respirator. It's something you probably see the guys that are painting, you know, spray painting a, a building or working in a factory wearing. It's actually fairly comfortable and, um, it does a very good job at, uh, at blocking out fiberglass particles and entering our lungs. The basic rule of thumb is if you can smell the fiberglass dust, that's a bad thing. Let's go ahead and cut this guy up. So one thing I failed to mention before, which I think kind of goes without saying, is to wear eye protection during this process. I mentioned that I'm using a ceramic cutoff wheel and these things, they come in packs of 50 because they break all the time. That's sort of the point. They wear down very quickly and they can shatter. And I've had one occasion in particular where I literally saw the blade shatter and then bounce off my glasses, which I had just put on moments before after contemplating going into the other room to grab them, and I would probably be blind in one eye if it wasn't for those. So 
Don't be stupid, wear glasses. And here I'm also using a shop vac, which I've uh, zip tied to my Dremel tool stand, which actually is the first time I've ever used it for this video, and it does a phenomenal job of keeping the dust out of my apartment and uh, keeping it from collecting places. So if you have a shop vac, I highly recommend using it for something like this. Cutting PC board with the Dremel tool is a little funny because you normally would want the blade to sink into whatever material you're cutting so you can cut across. But if you do that here, especially when you're hand holding, you can often torque the board and end up catching the blade and causing it to shatter. So you kind of want to let it run along the surface. However, at the same time, if you don't have a good enough groove, you can run into a scenario where the blade will slide back and forth and scratch off some of the copper or the uh, photo sensitive coating on either side. So you just going to take this kind of slow and be really careful. Um, I usually do one pass at medium depth and then let it cut all the way through for the second pass, which I can do very quickly without having to worry about catching the blade. So assuming you didn't cut any fingers off with the Dremel tool or whatever tool you ended up using to cut your PCB, you should be left with this. So the next step is going to be to peel off this white layer and expose the photo sensitive layer to ultraviolet light. So you're going to need an ultraviolet light source. Um, there's a number of ways to do this. Some people do it as simply as going outside during the day and using the sun to expose their board to ultraviolet light. Um, I'm usually not awake during daytime hours, and even if I was, uh, the intensity of the light coming from the sun is very unpredictable, and for repeatability's sake, you want to use a more controlled light source so that if it works really well one day with a certain exposure time, it'll work exactly the same way the next day with the same exposure time. You don't have to keep guessing every time you make a PCB. Other sources of light, some people use one of these, this is just a, uh, a straight up, I think it's a 500 watt work lamp. Uh, these things are incredibly hot and incredibly bright. If you're going to use one of these, you have to take off the glass filter in the front. It's the UV filter that's going to block all the UV light. They get really warm and they're really bright and really hot and kind of obnoxious. And also, I don't really know the intensity of the light coming out of here, so I'd have to guess around a bit to make sure that I get my exposure times right. Similar to if you've ever done black and white or any kind of film photography, you have to sort of guess around with your exposure time to calibrate it. So. Instead, I usually use this. This is a light fixture from MG Chemicals, the same guys that make the board. And it's nice that they have sort of dialed it in and they say that with this light fixture, 10 minute exposure should be enough for their light, their brand of photo sensitive PCB. This is, I think, just like an over the sink, under the cabinet light fixture. They put a special bulb in. It's kind of ghetto and it has these awful brackets that clearly were not designed to go in this fixture. Um, in fact, they kind of like almost break the plastic when you try to slide them on there. It's how they said to do it. So either I'm doing it way wrong or they're not designed very well. But the nice thing about these brackets is it does hold the lamp off the table at fixed distance. And it's a, uh, you know, something that they've already figured out 10 minutes at this distance, you should be fine. And it produces a nice even light source. So you end up with you know, a good, well-exposed board. So what's gonna happen next is I'm gonna take my PCB and I'm going to peel off this, the protective layer here, which is opaque to light. It's actually black on the back and I'm going to place my transparency onto the PCB. So what's basically going on here is you're casting a shadow onto the PCB with the transparency sheet with your design on it. And if you've ever been outside, well, I know you probably have, um, and, and looked at your shadow and played around, you might have noticed that your shadow tends to be more crisp the closer you are to the item you're casting a shadow on. If you do this with uh, you know, shadow puppets and that kind of thing, you probably noticed that as well. That's because if you have your light coming in at an angle, you know, the sun or the sky or reflecting off something nearby, um, light coming in at an angle, if your opaque material is far off the surface, then light can come in from multiple different angles and actually go past that edge um, and go underneath that, that object, whatever's blocking the light. So the closer that object gets in, the less opportunity there is for light coming in at an angle to bleed in through that edge. So because we want our edges to be very, very clear, we want to make sure that our transparency sheet is as close to the board as possible. And the way we do that is with a weight. This is just a sheet of, um, of some kind of acrylic that came with the lamp. Um, I'm sure you can use just about anything. Just make sure whatever you use is, does not block UV light. So this weight will basically push the transparency down flat onto the PCB because the transparency tends to bubble up a little bit or it'll slide around. But this makes sure it's nice and flat. And the one last thing you need to do to make sure that your transparency pattern is as close to the board as possible is what I kind of mentioned earlier. You want to make sure to use the flat side of the transparency sheet, the side with the toner actually on it. Because if you use the other side, well, first of all, in this case, your design will be backwards. But even assuming you already took care of that, um, you'll have a small gap between the actual opaque material and the PCB due to the thickness of the transparency sheet. And it doesn't seem like much, but it actually can really affect your design. It'll give you some really gross looking edges if you're not careful about that. So make sure you have the toner as close to the PCB as possible.
Now, I wish I could show you this next part where I'm actually going to set this whole thing up, but I can't because it needs to be basically well, as close to pitch black as possible in the room while I am aligning this thing once I peel off that layer. So I can't have any lights in here, which means my camera is not going to do a very good job. But what I will do is take care of this and then give you a shot of it really quick uh, once it's already set up. So it might be kind of hard to make out what you're seeing here, but basically, just as I described, I've got the light over my... Uh, or my PCB. I try to get it as close over the center as possible so that it does the most even lighting. And um, I'm going to leave this here for 10 minutes. So as soon as the PCB is done exposing to UV light after your 10 minute timer runs out, you're going to want to develop it somehow and you're going to need some kind of developer. Now, this is the really kind of crazy chemically bit to this whole process because PCB developer is basically sodium hydroxide, but is also known as lye. Now, lye is a very strong base. It can be very dangerous. And apparently it's also one of the ingredients in methamphetamines or in like certain explosives or whatnot. So it's kind of hard to buy it by itself. I think a lot of guides online are like, oh, just go down to your corner store and buy some lye. It's actually very hard to do, at least in the United States. I don't know if it is elsewhere. So they, you have to buy it in other forms. Uh, one of the main ingredients in Drano is actually lye. Now you can use Drano. I used to try doing this process with Drano. I've actually used uh, two different kinds, the powdered kind, and this bottle is totally beat to crap. It was like that when I bought it, uh, or liquid kind. This is, I don't think, a very good solution. It's hard to get the mixture right. You have to dilute it just the right amount, and if you dilute it too much, it takes too long. If you don't dilute it enough, you end up burning off all of the information on your PCB. The entire photosensitive layer comes off, so you end up with a blank slate, which isn't any good. So what I would recommend instead is going ahead and buying the real deal. This is MG Chemicals, again, is the brand, is their positive developer for their positive resist PCBs looks like something you buy at a chemical supply company. You can't actually get it on DigiKey. And in fact, I didn't know where the heck to buy this stuff for the longest time because I usually go to DigiKey for everything. For some reason, DigiKey sells no chemicals. So you have to go to Mauser or some other sellers to buy this kind of thing. This has some instructions on it on the back. It says, well, to remove cap, press down and twist off. The big one is dilute one part developer with 10 parts water. So that gets that math out of the way. In order to measure those quantities out, do I need some kind of measuring device? I went ahead and bought a proper graduated cylinder because I'll only be using a few hundred milliliters, actually just 100 milliliters of the final product. So that means I have to measure out accurately 10 milliliters of the developer that I add to my water. So you'll need something that can measure things precisely. You want to be pretty close to accurate because like I said, if it's too strong, you'll end up burning away all of your PCB edge resist. So you'll want to mix these in some kind of container. I just use a generic Tupperware container. I labeled it. So it says no food, meaning, you know, don't eat out of it once it's uh, been used. Also, just putting the board in the developer by itself is not going to actually do anything. You have to actively rub the surface of the etch resist material to actually get it to, to dissolve away. So you'll want some kind of brush. This is just a generic foam brush. I bought it for like 49 cents at the hardware store. MG Chemicals sells a brand of this brush, and I swear to God, it must be exactly the same thing, but they charge like $12 for it because they have their brand name on it and it actually has a part number. It's kind of hilarious. But yeah, don't do that. Just buy a generic foam brush, it'll be fine. Try to make sure there's no metal on it or anything. I think metal can be, especially if you use like, a, you know, if it's aluminum, it'll actually dissolve and lie and produce some gases and whatnot. So make sure it's just all plastic and wood and foam and you'll be fine. Also on that note, you want some safety gear. I have a pair of rubber gloves. They're rated for all kinds of chemicals. You look on the, uh, on the packaging for it. I just got them at Home Depot for a few dollars. Not a big deal. You'll also want some safety goggles. Uh, you saw me using these earlier. These are my typical woodworking goggles. So they're very good for that kind of thing. Unfortunately, they don't do a very good job of protecting you from chemical splashes. So you'll need to get a proper pair, something like these, uh, which are regular chem goggles. Um, they have a little seal around the bottom. You can probably find a comfy set, just regular chem goggles, the kind of things you use in the lab at school or whatever uh, will do. So now we're gonna go ahead and develop my PCB. Once your PCB has been exposed to UV light for 10 minutes, you want to drop into the developer as soon as possible to avoid any extraneous light from overexposing the board and causing it to ruin your image. For this reason, you want to have your developer mixed up and ready to go before the PCB is done. Once it is done, you can drop it into your developer and just start brushing it with your foam brush gently. As time wears on, you'll notice that the parts of the PCB that were exposed to UV light will start to dissolve away, exposing the copper underneath. The blue etch resist will turn more and more clear until it is gone entirely. This presents a problem because if you stop brushing as soon as you see the copper layer, you could leave an invisible layer of etch resist over the copper, which will prevent it from being etched properly. So you want to continue to brush even after you can see the copper just for a few seconds to be sure. 
So once that process is done, you'll be left with this. And that's basically just a piece of copper with uh, your photosensitive material on top. Now this is no longer light sensitive because it's already been developed. However, you ought to be careful with it just to make sure you don't scratch off any of the material if you handle it roughly. Any scratch will result in copper being burned away and it could potentially negatively affect your design. So uh, now we have to etch this guy and that involves some pretty strong acids. So you wanna make sure you grab all your safety gear you had before with the goggles, gloves and whatnot. There's a number of different materials, a number of different chemicals you can use for etching your PCB. Um, some people went as far as to use vinegar and salt, which I'm no chemist, but apparently produces hydrochloric acid, which can be used to dissolve copper. I tried this once, it kind of worked. It, you could see the copper starting to dissolve. It, it didn't really get very far. Um, I don't recommend trying it. What I did find it useful for is if you ever use a method of PCB manufacturing, where you don't have a photosensitive material on top and you're doing some kind of transfer method, it can be used uh, as a good mixture to clean off the copper surface. It'll kind of eat away at some of the, um, some of the uh, oxidized copper that can potentially get in the way of your etching. Another method I was using for a while, which worked out pretty well, was using muriatic acid and um, hydrogen peroxide and uh, this method worked okay for a while you end up creating what's called copper chloride I talked about this earlier in my blog if you've read it that far back um, I was using this for a while and it worked okay I um, again I don't really recommend this it's just there's yeah I can save you some money from buying a proper etchant but it's just so much work to get it down right and get everything working right and it's just a really big hassle so I don't recommend using this method either instead I'd recommend just buying some ferric chloride for the longest time, I always used ferric chloride from Radio Shack, and it's kind of overpriced. This bottle ran me like $12 or $15, something like that. And, um, you know, it's good for a few etchants, but it's kind of expensive. And I always wanted to order proper etchant online, but again, I was only looking on DigiKey, and I couldn't find it. Well, if you look around on Mauser, you'll find that they sell, again, our friend MG Chemicals brand etchant, and um, they can give you some pretty big jugs of it, and uh, it's just the same stuff. It's a great etchant. It works really well. It's fast, and it produces pretty good results. Now the thing is, with these acids, you can't just dump them down the sink when you're done with them. They are corrosive. To say nothing of the environmental impact of doing that, it could also damage the piping in your house. So what you'll want before you start is some method for storing the used etchant. I just bought some generic plastic containers that I put my used etchant in. Uh, ferric chloride turns kind of a dark, dark brown when it dissolves a lot of copper in it, so you should have a pretty good idea of when it stops working. Um, also, of course, you know, when it's, when it's spent up, it just doesn't dissolve very fast. So you'll put all your extra used etchant in here. And although I'm yet to have to do this, apparently the process is to, you know, when this bucket is full, you can neutralize it using uh, baking soda and then find a chemical treatment facility to take care of your etchant for you. Um, I'll probably be writing a blog post on that in the future, but you do not pour it down the drain even after it's neutralized. It can cause some big problems. So don't do that. Um, you also want an etchant tank. Now, I, for the longest time, used this uh, pretty crazy etchant tank I built. It looks something like this. Um, this is a Tupperware container, and I take everything out of it. Uh, I used a fish tank heater to heat the acid up to as well as hot as it goes, which is 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And um, then I had a fish tank bubbler to bubble air through a piece of PVC pipe, that I, or sorry, piece of uh, plastic tubing that I poked holes in to agitate the acid and uh, make sure that the etchant worked very well. Now, this is great if you have big boards, if you're doing like a whole, you know, something the size of a phone or a, even a you know small computer. But for really simple products, this is kind of overkill. What ends up happening is your board gets stuck in the bottom down here and you have to reach down in there to grab it with your gloves and hope you don't spill any acid out. So this is really great for a larger board, but for a smaller board, I recommend something like this. Again, our trusty uh, Ziploc brand Tupperware food container, but again, labeled uh, no food on the side. Um, this is some etching I've already used before. As you can see, it's kind of a brownish color, um, but it's still not spent yet, so I'm going to be using it again this time. But once this doesn't work anymore, I could just pour it in my bin and uh, replace it with some fresh stuff. So you want to heat your acid in some way. Um, basically, the, the two things that contribute to how fast the etching process works is how hot it is and how much you're agitating it. And uh, you want it to work very quickly because the faster it works, the less likely you're going to have undercutting and pitting and all kinds of things in your board, which cause you to have bad traces and bad electrical contact. So you'll have to agitate this by, I usually just do this kind of rocking motion to make sure that the acid washes over the PCB. And you'll also want to heat it. Now, earlier I used a fish tank heater, kind of overkill. What I'm going to use this time is just my work lamp again. If I focus this guy just a few inches off my 
PCB or maybe a foot or so, it will produce quite a bit of heat and heat up my acid to where it's at a good etching temperature. All right, so I let this thing heat up in front of the light for about the last 10 minutes, so it's already pretty warm. So I've got a pair of uh, bamboo tongs. These are, you can buy them at Bed Bath & Beyond for like a dollar. Um, if you're gonna be manipulating the board inside the acid, of course, your tongs or whatever you use cannot be metal. So these are wooden and there's no metal parts to them. So that's why I bought them. But um, honestly, you could probably use your fingers as well. But again, be careful. You don't want to scratch your etch resist because that will cause problems. So my PCB is now in there and I'm gonna just be rocking it back and forth. Now as you do this, you can kind of keep an eye on it and see the process unfold. Uh, it usually takes about 10 minutes or so to do this, so you just got to be patient. And you also don't want to leave it alone. Um, if you don't agitate, you'll find oftentimes certain parts of the boards will etch a lot faster than others. So in order to get all parts etched, you have to sort of over etch the, or the parts that etch more quickly. So the most striking evidence that your board is getting near uh, finished is that you'll see some of the light come through the PCB because uh, fiberglass is typically you know, a little bit translucent. If you're doing a two layer board, of course, this won't necessarily be the case, but uh, it lets you know you're getting close. And as soon as there is no more opaque copper between your traces, you should be ready to go. Alrighty, so um, I think our board is just about done. Just take it out, you can see that uh, most of it has uh, translucent parts, so we know we're good. Um, there's a little bit of a problem up here in the corner where stuff didn't quite etch all the way through. You can see, especially in this corner right here. And I think that was a result of me not paying attention while I was brushing it, neglecting to brush this side very well, probably because I was just fiddling with the camera equipment. So just to let you know, that's what I was talking about, where uh, you get a little layer, uh, invisible layer of etch resist left over and you end up with uh, a poor etch job. Fortunately, that's over in the corner where I can fix most of that and it's not gonna be that much trouble. Um, if that would happen over here, I'd probably have to toss the whole board and start over again. So after you remove the PCB from the etchant, wash the PCB off in the sink. Now I know I said it's not a good idea to pour the etchant down the sink, but we're talking about maybe the drop that might be stuck to the board, so it's not going to be a big deal. Just let the water run for a while to make sure it's very diluted before you do that. And once you're done with that, you'll have this. Now of course you still have this layer of this etch resistant material on there, which is kind of a lovely shade of blue, but it's going to get in the way as we start to try to solder things, so we have to remove it. The best way to do that is with a bottle of acetone. Now I don't recommend buying all the chemicals needed for this job at the same time you might get some funny looks from uh, the guys at walmart so a bit of acetone on a paper towel will do a very good job of getting your blue etch resist off leaving you with just the copper and we have a pretty good looking board here so once you've removed your etch resist you'll be left with this and this is a super close-up view i'm using so you can uh, kind of get an idea of how the board turned out. Um, this side of the board looks pretty good. Uh, the traces all look very clean. And you can see some areas where the traces actually had to go through uh, the little gauntlet of resistors and capacitors and it doesn't look like it's shorted out at all, so that's good. This corner, however, didn't turn out so well. Like I said before, I had a problem with brushing it, so some of the edge resist didn't get removed during the development process. So it protected the copper when it shouldn't have and there you have these problems where the traces look like they're shorted the ground. So at this stage, you're going to want to do an electrical inspection of the board, and there's two ways to do that, visually and electrically. So typically, a visual inspection will help get rid of some of the bigger points, such as this one that's very obviously a short. Um, a lot of times, they aren't quite that obvious, and you'll need a tool to help you see closer. For that, I use an eye loop. Uh, this is a jeweler's loop. You can get them for cheap on Amazon. This came in like a two-pack, and they have different magnifications. They're really great for spotting those super, super small shorts, where it's just a simple, a tiny little fiber of copper that's uh, holding the two traces together. Uh, the other way to do it is electrically, and if you have any multimeter with a conductivity test, you can put it into a mode where when the two leads of the multimeter touch, they'll give you a nice audio, uh, audible beeping sound. So you can use this to check for shorts. For example, I can touch the ground plane with one probe and touch a trace with another probe carefully. And because I'm hearing that beep, that means that I've got a short. It looks like both of these over here are kind of screwed up, whereas over here, these are not so much. They look pretty healthy. So when you do find a short, you'll have to do something to open it. And what I usually use is an X-Acto knife. I think it's kind of the industry standard blade for this kind of purpose. And all you really have to do is go around your trace and uh, cut away the copper that's shorting it together. Now, you don't just want to cut like a you'd cut a cake or something like that, because even though you've separated the copper, they, uh, the two pieces of copper can kind of bend back into each other and cause the short to occur again. So you want to make sure you cut in sort of V-scoring action from both sides to actually remove some uh, 
of the copper, removes the material, and that'll guarantee that the copper can't bend back into shape. It looks like those are the only shorts I really had to deal with. You can see here where I've scratched away the copper that was shorting the two traces together. Um, I've had times when I didn't have to remove anything at all and it was perfect right off the bat. This time, of course, I made a little mistake, but otherwise I'm okay. So the next thing you're gonna wanna do is to drill your holes. The size of drill bit you're going to need depends on the size of the holes you specified in your board. I usually try to use 1 32nd inch holes, which means you're gonna need a very fine drill bit. This is the kind that you won't normally get in a typical set of drill bits at Home Depot. This is a 1 32nd inch drill bit, or 0 0.031 inch, and I bought it on DigiKey. It was actually kind of expensive. I think it was about $10 or so, but um, I've only had one before that broke. They're, they're fairly durable if you're careful with them, and they can drill very fine holes. I usually use a drill press for this kind of job. You could probably do it with a hand drill, but if you have access to a small tabletop press, I highly recommend using that. That'll take care of most of our holes. The only ones that are any larger than that are maybe some of the mounting holes over here for my switch or the holes for my transformer, which would have to be drilled with a larger drill bit. So the first thing you'll probably notice here is that my drill press is actually not bolted down to my table, and because it vibrates so much, it tends to slide around a bit. It's not that big of a deal, it's only sliding a few inches left and right, but when you're zoomed in this close, I guess it's a lot more obvious. So what I'm doing here is just going around the board and drilling the holes wherever I see them. I didn't bother hooking up the vacuum this time around because the particles produced by this process are a lot less fine than the particles produced by the Dremel tool, so they tend to not get suspended in the air. What makes this process easier is that the drill bit will tend to be guided into the hole by the copper surrounding the hole. So even if you're not quite centered, oftentimes you'll get a good cut. This can be a problem if your PCB is poorly etched and you have partially missing holes, so be especially careful in those scenarios. Also, as a general rule, you're going to forget some holes your first time through. I've had boards with less than 20 holes and I thought I was done, started soldering my components on, and then only later realized they were missing. I find the best way to avoid this is to simply hold the board up to a light source to look through it and that usually makes the undrilled holes a lot more obvious. Cutting out the corners of the Dremel tool is much easier than making the straight cuts as we did before. Because the cuts are so short, the blade is much less likely to get caught and possibly broken off. Also, because everything is so small here, you can actually use the Dremel Tools blade as a grinder bit and grind away at the edge, allowing you to produce smooth curves or whatever other shape you need. So when you're done with the whole process, you'll be left with this. As you can see, I've cut out the corners. I also widened some of my holes to fit some of the larger components in the mounting holes and whatnot. So now you wanna see if your board will fit into your box. So this is the box I got. Uh, it comes with three parts. You have the lid, the main part, uh, the main box, and then it comes with some screws. Now these screws are only for keeping the lid on. These are not mounting screws, so you'll have to purchase some mounting screws separately. If you look at the data sheet for this part, it'll recommend a model number for a mounting screw, also made by Hammond. It's a self-tapping screw. Uh, they come in packs of 100, and they're also available on DigiKey. So we can see if our board will fit in here. And of course, we're doing copper side down, because that's how we set our board up. And you'll see it drops in rather nicely. Now you can... Uh, by screwing this guy in with one of our mounting screws. And these will go right into our mounting bosses on the plastic enclosure. Get it lined up well, and there you go. So that's an example. Um, now you also wanna to check to make sure all your through hole components fit. Uh, for example, this switch goes right here and it looks like it fits in there pretty well. And then of course our transformer, which never had a data sheet, the part we're probably the least certain about, uh, looks like it fits in there Pretty well, I had to widen those holes up a little bit, but uh, otherwise it fits okay. Now, of course, before you can close this thing, you'll have to cut some holes out for the switch and the transformer and whatever other buttons or whatever you have that will poke through the lid of your box. I'm not gonna cover that in this video, but you can use a Dremel tool or a routing bit on a drill press or a table mill if you have one, and that can give you a nice enclosed box and everything's bolted down tight and nothing will slide around and you're ready to start soldering and ready to start debugging. So. Uh, that's all I have for this video. Thank you so much for watching, and uh, if you keep an eye on my blog, you'll find out what this thing actually is supposed to do.